Well, hello, everybody watching this special webinar, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Wynne Jenkins. I'm the editor of Intelligent Shura. I'm going to be moderating today and guiding us through the content. And we're going to be exploring some of the challenges uh, facing MGAs and hopefully revealing some solutions. Um, the exact title of the webinar today is how hybrid front-end solutions can help MGAs navigate a challenging landscape. And we've developed uh, this webinar uh, very closely and in association with AM Specialty Insurance Company, also known as ASIC. Um, just to give you a bit of context, I'm sure most people watching this will be very well aware of some of the challenges facing MGAs at the moment. Uh, they're multifaceted, very complex, and in some cases you might say unprecedented from inflation to intensifying competition, uh, challenges around access to capital and reinsurance, and of course the ever-changing digital landscape. MGA is really getting it from all sides, you might say. Um, but there, there are certainly some carry, uh, new, not new necessarily, but carriers out, out there operating in this, in this space, offering some innovative and increasingly sophisticated solutions. That's really at the core of what we're gonna be talking about today. And as I said earlier, hopefully offering some solutions. We've got a stellar panel to talk us through today. Um, I'm just going to introduce everybody very briefly initially and then give everybody a chance to uh, do that in more detail, give you some uh, context on their background and perspective today. Um, so uh, bottom left on my screen um, in the ASIC offices, we've got Siobhan Bader, the CEO um, of, I'll say it again, but Am Specialty Insurance Company. Um, Dominic Tassoni, uh, the CEO of Am Specialty Insurance Company. We've got Matt uh, Petka, the Managing Director at Guy Carpenter, and Jeremy Dyche, General Counsel and Head of Compliance at Boost Insurance. Um, so welcome all. Um, I hope you're all sort of uh, ready to sort of offer some solutions today. Um, if I, I said, can I, if I can just start, I think it's really helpful in these situations to get a bit of perspective from everyone. So perhaps you could just give a very brief introduction on yourselves, um, anything relevant in your career, and perhaps a little bit about your perspective on this issue. Um, Siobhan, it seems right we should start with you. Great. Thanks, Wynne. It's great to be here. I'm CEO of AM, uh, ASIC, which is an excess and surplus lines carrier authorized out of Arizona, based in Dallas, Texas. I started my career as a Lloyds broker, starting with Willis, um, Alexander Howden and Sedgwick. I was involved in my first MGA. I co-founded my first MGA in 2000 at Marine Re, which is a marine reinsurance MGA based in Toronto, Canada. We sold that MGA to Ironshore and integrated it into a division of the company. We created our second MGA, Amory, in 2014, based out of Manhattan, New York, which was, uh, again, a reinsurance MGA right of diversified lines. We built that MGA to $650 million of specialty program business. In 2022, we launched ASIC, which is an excess and surplus lines carrier based in Dallas. Okay. Uh, thanks, for what ASIC, I think I'll, I'll start using that. It's much easier. Um, Dominic, do you want to give us a bit about when you joined ASIC in your, in your career before that? Sure. Thanks, Wynn. So Dominic is showing the chief underwriting officer here at ASIC. I've been in the business for 40 years, which those watching are probably shocked because of my youthful looks, but it is true, 40 years. The past 25 years, I've been managing programs with three major carriers at uh, a number of leadership roles with QBE. I was head of programs for Aspen Insurance Company. Um, prior to coming on board with ASIC, I was the vice president of underwriting with Spinnaker Insurance Companies. Responsibilities include profit loss within the portfolio, developing new opportunities within program relationships, you know, very strategic. It's always been driven by, you know, underwriting discipline, underwriting profit. You know, I look at this opportunity here, which, you know, the, the viewer will get the perspective of the carrier, the MGU and the reinsurance broker, all a very important part of the equation here. So excited to, you know, to, to join this panel and uh, I'll give it back to you, Wendt. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt, do you want to give us a bit about yourselves and your role at Guy Carpenter? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Wynn. Uh, Matt Petka, I uh, manage the director and lead uh, GC Access. GC Access is Guy Carpenter's dedicated MGA and program platform. Uh, we've got dedicated represented in, uh, in all of our offices. Uh, I've got a counterpart in, in London uh, that taps into uh, the, the European market as well. Um, 
prior to joining Guy Carpenter, I was at Willis Free uh, in Dallas uh, for over 15 years, uh, helped develop their, their program practice. Uh, but I've been in the business for uh, for almost 20 years uh, and really dedicated um, my career to the MGA and, and program space. So I've seen uh, I've seen it evolve from um, to from a you know I wouldn't say the not so golden age to the golden age to where we are today. So uh, it's been an exciting, uh, fun career, uh, you know, supporting MGAs and, and program careers. Great, thank you. Um, and, and we've got lots of different perspectives on on the call today. But Jeremy, do you want to explain yours and, and a bit about Boost, please? Gladly, gladly. Uh, you know, first I'll start and uh, thank you, Win, and, and thank um, ASIC for sponsoring and having us here today. Um, it's a great panel and a great topic and, and one that is, um, you know, extremely timely um, and, and hopefully uh, everyone enjoys. So I'm Jeremy Deitch. I am general counsel and head of compliance at Boost Insurance, which is an MGA um, by trade. Um, we empower any company to engage with their customers and increase sales by offering insurance through their own digital experience. And so we're licensed to develop and sell PNC insurance products in all 50 states. Um, we provide what we call insurance infrastructure as a service, and that packages necessary compliance, operational, capital, and technological components of an insurance pro program into essentially a turnkey white label solution accessible via a simple API integration. And so, you know, businesses that partner with Boost and the insurance and reinsurance that Boost uh, partners with on the back end can reduce the cost and, and complexity of building. Um, that insurance function. I have been at Boost for uh, over four years. Um, and prior to, I've been in insurance the entirety of my, uh, my, pr my legal practice and career, um, serving as uh, regulatory and transactional product um, coverage claims, sort of the anything that you need uh, counsel for to um, domestic carriers here in the US, syndicates in London, Bermuda, um, and Japan based. And so um, did that until uh, I was saved from the dark halls of corporate law firm life um, and brought into the, the back end business of insurance, specifically MGA business, um, and getting to uh, work with, um, you know, some of the best in that business being ASIC and Guy Carp and, and others. So, um, you know, happy to, uh, to be here and, and hope to give uh, a great perspective on it all. Great. Th thanks, Jeremy. Well, it sounds like you've got enough perspective just in you there. So this could be a good discussion. Um, so just before I do anything else, um, so everybody watching this, I think we had about 200 registrants. Um, I can see the number of live people ticking up. Um, this is interactive. OK, so please, at any point in the discussion, uh, send in questions. We'll get to them when we can. The panelists will see them. And if we don't get to them, we, we've reserved some time at the end. So please send questions. Um, as we go along, okay? Um, now, I, I give a bit of a flavor at the start of what we're going to be talking about. Um, and hopefully, we'll get a lot of this will be solutions and positive sort of answers for MGAs. But I do think we probably need to set the landscape a little bit first. Um, so, Matt, perhaps, perhaps uh, you'd be a good person to start this. Um, can you just give us a bit of a sense of how the landscape for MGAs has perhaps uh, changed in, in recent years in, in your experience and perhaps some of those forces at, at, at sort of uh, uh, changing things at the moment? Yeah, no, sure. Happy to happy to do that. Uh, and like I mentioned, I've been in the DMJ space for a long time, as, uh, as everyone on the call here. So we've we've seen it evolve. I mean, uh, you know, over the past ten years, the the amount of seated premium to the market uh, is doubled. You know, some estimates seem you know, sixty to seventy billion. Um, and you know, it, it's it's evolved in a, in a very good way. In that, you know, MGAs and, and hybrid carriers are embracing the things that traditional carriers uh, and reinsurers want to see. You know underwriting risk, technology, analytics, uh, things like that. Uh, but we're, we're definitely at a point where there's a, a capacity crunch. Uh, you know, the, the hybrid slash fronting model, is, it's crowded, right? There's, there's over 20 plus um, hybrid carrier fronts, uh, whereas in early in my career, there was a handful. I could count them on one hand. Um, and similar to the MJ space. So I, I think, um, you know, that is, is certainly a headwind um, the, 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 the tightening reinsurance capacity, uh, and the, um, and the underwriting discipline and flight to quality that reinsurers are, are demanding, um, you know, is flowing through. So that's limiting startups. That's, that's limiting, um, uh, I would say new opportunities that don't necessarily have the data, 
uh, or the, uh, the, the underwriting expertise of the team. So uh, that's certainly going to play a, a role in, you know, at least for the next year or two, right? Uh, you know, who knows where the, you know, these, the, the dark clouds of the economy may come in uh, to play, but will certainly impact uh, our industry and, you know, the, the MGA space as well. So uh, it's, it's been, uh, you know, a really good run. I mentioned the golden age and I really wasn't kidding uh because you know i think it's evolved uh rightfully so into a, a really robust uh functioning arm for 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 carriers reinsurers and 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 you know the entrepreneurs that go out and, and start their own mga so i think it's here to stay i think it's here to it'll continue to grow but there's certainly uh some some headwinds uh on the horizon um that that mgas and, and carriers and reinsurers quite frankly will need to maneuver okay um, Jeremy, perhaps coming to you next, uh, Matt's mentioned there the dark clouds of the economy and capacity crunch. Would you agree with that? And what, perhaps what other things uh, might you add? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, there, there's no hiding it and there's no uh, reason you should. You have to uh, accept the status of things as they are and react in kind. And I think that's kind of the theme um, with what a hybrid front kind of embraces more than <clears throat> It is adapting to the market. It is providing what the market needs on both sides of it. And that means on the distribution of the insurance to you know today's modern consumer insur insured, as well as on the back end, the, the front, the reinsurance, uh, you know, and, and back into the stack. And so, you know, it's a tough market um, for a lot of lines of business and people need to be um, extremely drilled in and focused on not only their their target um, and their their method for distribution, but how the book is going to perform. And what that's going to do is going to unlock avenues both on the consumer side and on the capacity side. And you know, one of the keys is embracing technology. Um, you know, Boost is an MGA. We are part of the InsureTech revolution um, to the extent you can still say that because InsureTech's been around. Um, you know, we are trying to focus as much on the uh, tech as we are on the insurance because you can't have one without the other. And I think that is, you know, one of the big headwinds that everyone is seeing at every layer of, of the insurance value chain. It's embracing technology for methods of distribution, getting into the point of sale in different varieties. Um, but I think in most, in most important, it's about the data. It's about the analytics and it's about real time maneuverability so that you can both you know, adjust to a hardening, a lightning, a moderate type of market um, and not wait for annual kind of cycles. You're, you need to be real time. Um, I think that is kind of the key at every level, whether it's underwriting, claims, product review, um, capacity deployment. I think that might be the overdriving uh, theme of the market today. Okay, and Jeremy, you, you mentioned multiple challenges, which there are, what, what would be top of your list? Well, you know, uh, capacity crunch um, is is really there. Um, it's kind of the buzzword of the day, um, but it really is true. Um, it's reinsurance um, and the capacity behind it are really focusing in on how to deploy their capital, just like anything else. When you look at startups or companies that are being funded, um, when a market is as um, volatile as ours has been as of late, um, and it really is globally, uh, people, people kind of uh, batten down the hatches and we're seeing that at, at every level. And so what one of the things that um, unlocks capacity, gives comfort level to those that are deploying the capital on the back end is that hybrid front that like that an ASIC is deploying. When a fronting carrier that takes the decision that they are going to share in the risk, they are going to put skin in the game on the book of business that they are writing, not just provide their license, that changes the game in terms of the deployment of capacity. And I believe that the reinsurers then look at not only the front and carrier, but the distribution in front of that as um, aligned interest. I think that's got to be the key to it all. When you can align interests from the very point of sale at modern consumer to the very back end of, of capacity providing, that's when we're going to both provide um, the best possible products, the best possible risk retention, and the best possible book performance in the back end. 
Okay. okay. Um, so, Paul, I'm perhaps coming to you next. Now, you, you're probably dying to start giving solutions, okay? And, and trust me, we'll have loads on that. But I, I'm just curious, I mean, give, given your extensive background, you've run an MGA, you know, you, you, you've worked extensively across this entire industry. Before we get to the solutions, I would be interested in just how you see the landscape at the moment, perhaps, you know, in the context of what you've seen during your career. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the comments that have been made before me. You know, as an MGA owner and operator for 20 years in the market, I completely understand the challenges that MGAs face currently in the market. It's a very difficult market. Um, you're seeing inflation come in and really affect the market very radically, you know, in terms of claims, rates, um, and it's working, you know, right through all classes of business which I think almost is kind of unexpected. You know, interest rates have been, have, have been risen successfully, but all of a sudden there's wham, there's this massive effect that really has been knocked on subsequent to the pandemic. You know, I think the pandemic actually had a massive effect on the industry and we're just continuing to see that influence play out um, as we come out of the back end of that. Um, in, a diff in, in addition, you have, you know, cost of living, you have, you know, admitted, you know, rates versus the ENS uh, market, you know, that's a challenge situation for the consumer versus, you know, the open, more open ENS uh, market. You have the Ukraine-Russia situation, which by no means is anywhere resolved, and that's going to be an ongoing, um, you know, peripheral effect, uh, you know, to the market. Um, we've seen, you know, rates increase between 30 and 40 percent. The other thing about this market is that, you know, unless you really have a tried and tested business model, it's very easy for established reinsurance uh, markets to walk away from startups, to walk away from, you know, new business uh, setups. And so, again, that's that's a real challenge to the market. Um, you know, you as Jeremy said, you really have to have your business model in a very succinct and cohesive way, really know the direction that you want to go to and be able to market yourself. And as he mentioned, marketing yourself in tandem with you know, a hybrid front or, or a more specialized cap capacity provider, you know, that's gotta be the way to go in this market because um, it's, it's just so very challenged out there. Okay. Um, Dominic, just in your role as Chief Underwriting Officer, any any other challenges you'd like to mention or they all be covered? Well, yeah, I mean, again, I agree with everything that's been said so far. I would add that the MGA has, you know, they have a lot of competition, not only within the MGA space against one another, but also with carriers who see what they do and think that they can do it better. Well, that's not true, right? They, they can't do it better. The model works, and that's why we're, you know, I've been successful in my 25 years in programs. Siobhan's done an incredible job with the team here. You know, listen, technology is key. Analytics is key. We all know that reinsurance capacity is, is tight right now. And what are reinsurers looking for? They're looking for companies that one, have underwriting expertise in multiple lines that, are, that have the claims expertise, that have the analytics that go behind that. And I think an MGA is also looking for that right? Looking for long-term relationships. And I think when you combine that and you have significant risk in the game, and I, I'm going to tell you that ASIC will have significant risk in the game, much different than, you know, again, this is hybrid fronting discussion, but much different than many of the fronting carriers, because we're taking more of a traditional approach to this model. And I think it'd be successful. And I think the underwriting approach that we take, whether it's touch points monthly with our partners, talking about reserving, pricing, what is working within each segment of, of the portfolio, fixing as in partnership uh, on items that might not be working, pushing price as much as we possibly can, and looking for ways to expand. That's long-term partnerships. We're not here for short-term play, get out two, three years. We want to be, want to be here for you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. That's, that's the important. And having ENS paper allows us to be flexible, meaning we can pivot quick. We can change terms. We can push price. We are not reliant on regulatory bodies with admitted paper, right, to approve rates, to approve terms. And I think that's where we're going to be very successful. Yeah, yeah. So, so Siobhan, coming, coming back to that, I mean, if I was to say to you, you know, we, we've, we've heard a lot of challenges there, and I would say, okay, how, how do MGAs respond to that then? I, I mean, your answer, I assume, would be around innovation, hybrid working, partnerships, some of the things that Dominic's just said. 
could, could you give us a sense of how you'd sort of answer that to, to an MGA really um, experiencing these challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like a lot of things that have all been mentioned already. You know, the issue is you've got to push your business model to the best of your ability. And today, you know, MGAs have moved into the ENS space in a very meaningful way with the advent of private equity coming in and supporting MGAs. You know, when I started business, MGAs were like small mom and pop or organizations that got binding authorities from Lloyd's. You know, that kind of concept has been blasted out of the market. And MGAs today are really sophisticated mini insurance companies. And they've moved into a space, taken hold of business. And now this is about them maintaining that position and moving forward. In order to do that, you really have to engage with all aspects, you know, of, um, you know, the insurance model, meaning, you know, you have to have high quality data, you have to embrace technology. You know, the insurance industry has been really slow to embrace technology, but I think the advent of the pandemic has moved that forward quite significantly. And, you know, even for example with us, you know, we created our own proprietary software and we're able to use that and allow any uh, security that we engage with to access our data through a separate portal. So, you know, technology is a fantastic accoutrement that MGAs can use to really, you know, engage with the market in a very advanced way in terms of efficiency, um, you know, execution of their platform, bringing that forward. But, you know, not all MGAs are created equal. So, you know, the thing about this market, which is going to separate the good from the bad, is that, you know, it's going to be a traditional focus on quality of results. I'm afraid that's really what it's going to go back to quality of results. And with fronters, you know, fronters, I don't think can, can look at MGAs anymore as, as a credit risk. You know, the fronting community was capable, you know, as, as Matt said, you know, the golden years, you know, you could go in front program and it, all you were concerned about was the volume that is over and it's gone. And really what it's about now is quality underwriting and making sure that your model stacks up to a profitable level. Okay, um, Matt, I, I think your perspective would be interesting here because we've, we've heard the challenges and we've heard, look, some of these solutions are innovation, risk sharing, hybrid uh, front and solutions and so on. Um, how sort of unique and, and sort of new are some of those solutions? And, and to what extent is that sort of, um, uh, I guess separating the wheat from the chaff in terms of quality MGAs, perhaps those that are not quite quite so good. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> to to maybe oversimplify it a bit, you know, I think you know, the 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 early uh, stages of, of fronting was exactly that. It was just a way for an MGA to, to rent the carrier's paper, um, and it was essentially uh, it negotiated and passed on directly to the reinsurer. Um, and there's 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 definitely a need for the the pure front in certain circumstances, but as the the, the model has evolved, so that, let's just put that in one bucket. The, the the second bucket I'll mention is is really just a pure balance sheet um, model where they they're not they're not buying reinsurance. They give like a Berkshire Hathaway or something like that, that that wants access to a particular line of business, and they can bolt on an MGA or uh, uh, relatively quickly and, and cost effectively. The third model, which is evolving, uh, is, is this hybrid space. And, you know, we've seen it, you know, over the past 10 to 12 years really evolve from a, a fronting only model to uh, really a, a, a net retained model where reinsurers are, are forcing the hand of these fronting models to take risk. Um, and, you know, some of these fronting models do a better job at underwriting, quite frankly. Than, than others, right? There's, you know, you have a, uh, a an original uh, fronting carrier that was started by, you know, just say private equity, and and they're driven, you know, primarily by growth, uh, not you know underwriting results. So you, you have more of a marketing angle to to uh, to, to fronting carriers like that versus, you know, an underwriting first model. Uh, I think that you know that coupled with the the data and the expertise of an underwriting team that can get done in a, in, in a, in a challenging reinsurance market. Um, you know, reinsurers are, you know, are, are, are at the wheel, so to speak, as far as, you know, the, the boxes that need to be checked for, for a, a, an MGA and, and carrier submission to, to get support. And uh, probably at the top of the list is 
who who's the carrier and is the carrier willing to take you know have skin in the game and 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 uh, and to what acumen is, is 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 their underwriting expertise. So it's it's certainly evolving. It's it's here to stay. And I think the the hybrid space underwriting first model is, is going to win out uh, you know, over time. So uh, I, I think that's and plus from my perspective, you know, as, as the reinsurance broker, it certainly opens the door to the the entire market, right? Where we can talk to uh, you know folks like Swiss and Munich and Hanover. Whereas, uh, you know, sometimes it can be limited if, if there's not a perceived alignment of interest from the carrier to the MGA. Uh, so it, it, it makes the marketing efforts, um, you know, a lot easier, uh, per se. So. And, and, and that journey of the market um, has, has been on that. Would you describe that as kind of almost a natural evolution or is it being sort of accelerated by some of the challenges we've talked about and or is it the sort of technology influence? Yeah, I think uh, it's 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 been accelerated certainly by the you know the economy, the reinsurance results, right? Reinsurers, uh, you know, overall have not been you know making money uh, in, in certainly particular lines of business uh, that are capacity constrained. That's forcing the hand uh, of of their carrier partners uh, to really laser focus on you know really quality MGAs. Uh, and I think that in and of itself, you know, lends to analytics and technology. I mean, I, I can tell you that, you know, over time, if MGAs are not embracing technology and, you know, the analytics, you know, the analytical firepower that someone like Guy Carpenter can bring to help supplement what they currently have, or, you know, if they're looking for industry data, something like that, you know, I think they're going to be uh, put in the, you know, the bottom quartile of MJ opportunities and buckets with with reinsurers and carriers, quite frankly, because the carriers are going to focus on the best performing, best quality MJs that embrace data, have the technology that they can support because they're putting you know their uh, their capital at risk alongside the reinsurer. Okay, um, just to say, it's, it's great to see some uh, questions starting to come in. Um, I encourage the panelists to look at them. Some of which we'll do as we go along, and uh, some we can keep to the end. Um, but keep them coming, anybody watching this. Um, Jeremy, just, just picking up on, on what Matt said there, I mean, do, do you want to kind of elaborate on that? And I, and I guess, I mean, I, I'm sure you're going to obviously talk about uh, Boost, but it would also be interesting to hear your perspective of, you know, how do MGAs respond in terms of almost advice you would give to others, possibly, that are not uh, as advanced as Boost? Uh, yeah, see, I don't even have to do the shameless plug. You're, you're doing it for me. <laughs> um, and no, you know, uh, I really think, um, you know, everyone is, is really dead on and, and Matt's right. I think, you know, it's it's all of the above and that's kind of a cop out of an answer, but it's the truth. And what I what I mean by that is that you have to embrace technology, not just to embrace technology so that you can say you embrace technology. You need to have it actually permeate every level of what you do business as an MGA that's partnered with a hybrid front, any front or the reinsurance. And so that needs to be at your distribution point, that needs to be at your product level. So the development, the underwriting at the forefront and as on in the, in the program management, you need to be able to utilize those technological advances to your you know advantage, frankly, and not just have them as a shiny toy. Um, we're past that part of the insured tech uh, movement. We're at the point where now, there is almost incumbent insure tech. And I think that's where we're actually gonna see the best innovation because now you are taking the, the tried and true practices of the insurance market and industry, which, you know, something that has lived for 300 plus years um, is doing something right. It doesn't mean it's doing everything right. And that's why we're, you know, we're here. Um, and, you know, my CEO who's probably listening is, you know, curling over at, as I as I give credit to the you know monolith of, of Lloyd's. But you have to take what works well and you have to adapt it to the technology and to the modern environment that you're in. So, you know, I really do think that one of the things that comes from that is quality of results. Siobhan, I couldn't agree more in that. I think that is what's going to separate any MGA because it is a saturated market and every day it becomes even more of a saturated market and frankly a company like boost that allows other companies to almost play in the space of an mga you know helps and adds to that kind of traffic jam and so the ones that utilize technology 
utilize the expertise of the fronts and the reinsurers. I think that's a very overlooked aspect. People think that they know everything, but the key is to partner with the right people. You know, an ASIC doesn't just put their money where their mouth is, they put their expertise where their mouth is. And I think that also separates. If you find a, fr a hybrid front and reinsurers that are doing the same, they are coming out from behind the scenes of the insurance. They're not just here to provide the license and the paper. They're not just here to provide the you know actual monetary capital um, and share in the profits. They're there to opine on the coverages, opine on the market trends, see how claims operate, see where, test theories. I think when you have that, that's a different skin in the game. And that's going to be the differentiator both for a hybrid front trying to you know take advantage of that opportunity but as well as the mgas that are smart enough to get out of their own way you know you, you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know until you're in it and if you're in it with the right partners you'll be able to adapt one of the key aspects of that is data data is the key to it all in my opinion um Granted, you know, that's kind of the ethos of where I come from in my career and, and, and currently at Boost. But clean data in, the ability to analyze it and apply it to your product, to your distribution, to your marketing, to your ethos, to your capacity, that is the actual key to get those quality of results. And if you're able to do that, whether it be in the ENS market where you have ultimate freedom of form and rate, or even in the admitted market. Listen, you know, I, I believe that there needs to be a, 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 a shift in the ideas behind regulators as a obstacle to innovation or an obstacle to our ability to maneuver. And so technology can allow an admitted product to even move around in the admitted space with the same freedom, maybe not of rate, but of form. Um, platforms that utilize API, so API, the interconnectivity between a, a, a distribution partner, their front and the reinsurers on the background, when you're taking all of that data and it's cyclical, you're taking claims into underwriting, underwriting into claims and distribution, and you're able to adapt to the market, whether that's a jurisdictional development on the commercial side, whether that's just a, you know, a property aspect due to, to weather patterns, that's <laughs> where you both as an MGA, the partners that you have in your book of business will differentiate. And, and, and Jeremy, I'm just going to sort of ask this on behalf of MGAs, but apart from ASIC, but I mean, if, if they're looking to work with a partner specifically on technology or data or whatever, do you have any advice on how you might pick the right partner? Uh, boost. <laughs> um, well, that's a shameless plug. <laughs> yes. The key for any MGA is yeah. to partner with a front and the reinsurance um, panel or however that's constructed that is willing to embrace that ability that I just talked to. And so, you know, unfortunately, without, you know, being disparaging to the industry that I've dedicated my career to, not every partner is willing to do so. I don't know that the entire shift has happened and it hasn't been embraced. Some of it is embraced in a cosmetic manner. And I think an MGA that is really looking to succeed for the long haul, which is always going to include technological advancement from now, tomorrow, and the days to come, have to have a partner that is willing to work with that. And so I mentioned APIs. There's a, there's a, a slew of ways that things can work. But a partner uh, on a front side that is willing to um, have that interconnectivity, your systems talking to their systems so that, you know, Siobhan referenced the portals that they have developed. When you have real time analysis and it's not a fronting partner or a reinsurer that is waiting for monthly or quarterly bordero to analyze the health of a book, you are able to all partner in real time. That is the key. And so any MGA that is looking to um, ride the waves, and that's the best advice I give, it's you have to ride the waves as they come. You, you can't swim against the stream. You're gonna go with what the market goes with. But if you have a partner that is able to ebb and flow with you based off of data analytics, real time involvement and interactive process into the health of your business, that is the best advice that I could give to any MGA. OK, um, so Siobhan, now might be a good time to talk about the portals you mentioned earlier, um, some of the technology and, and obviously follow up on anything else that's been said. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, it goes back to transparency and professionalism, really, you know, at the end of the day, I like to think that this business is relationship based. And as we, you know, made very clear technology and bringing companies, these, you know, um, MGAs, which are now very key to the ENS space, bringing them forward, you know, as much as we can. So, you know, it's transparency, it's access to data, you know, the concept of real time results. They are very material to, you know, the development of a good quality portfolio of business. You know, I don't want it to be all completely doom and gloom. You know, the U.S. You know, U.S. business, um, in a generic sense, has always been a very attractive, um, you know, class of business to the U.S. market and to international markets because it's very high quality. It's homogeneous. You know. And, and so I, I like to think that we're lucky enough to be sitting in the U.S. writing, you know, good quality risks. Um, the capacity is an issue and there are ways, you know, there are ways for MGAs to, I guess, put their best foot forward. So, you know, technology, choosing a capacity provider that's going to partner with you, old fashioned underwriting expertise, I think is very key, key and really is, you know, the mantra of the market currently as we move forward. You know, it's communicating your effect message effectively to the reinsurance market so they can understand, you know, the risks that, um, you know, they are acquiring. I think that that's really key. So, you know, technology does play a very meaningful role just in the communication of the risk and uh, the management of the process. You know, it creates huge efficiency with regards to, you know, uh, expediting the process of the underwriting. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, Paul, I don't have any notice. I think my connection dropped very briefly, if anybody noticed. And I'm back. Um, Dominic, do you want to follow up on anything uh, Siobhan said then? Yeah, listen, I, I think it's uh, in, in this time, I think uh, the FGA space, they're, they're becoming more and more sophisticated, right? And I think as we go through an extensive due diligence process, which could take between three and six months, data is important. We have a robust system that can that can partner with a, an MGA system to provide critical data, really get into segments within the portfolio and help assist them to either fix something that might not be uh, performing well or help them grow in certain segments that are, are that where we see an opportunity to expand the relationship. I think that's that's real important. You know, it's you know, we look at four things, and Trevon's heard over the past four months me say this and she's probably tired of me saying this but we look at four areas other than price we're looking at the underwriting expertise and mgas like i said are becoming more sophisticated they've got the underwriting expertise many times it dovetails with our expertise love that we're looking at you uh specialized insuring agreements that are very unique to the standard market standard market doesn't understand it doesn't want to deal in that space you're looking at claims expertise you look at the boost claims expertise and we, that's very important to us, right? How are they handling the claims? Uh, how are they handling from a, from a legal standpoint? Loss control on property. And then you're looking at unique distribution. All four areas other than price. And I would say that MGA should be doing their due diligence on the carrier. That's important because what they've seen is they've seen carriers that, that have some legacy associated with it and they might be performing well and the division might be performing well, but because certain aspects of a company's uh, division is not performing well, they get a call one day and they say we're out of programs, right? They want long-term partnerships. Here, we have no leg, we have no legacy. I mean, again, for me, somebody who's been in the business for you know 40 years, this is the best place to be. We have so much potential here. We have so much potential offering a, a robust analytical system. The, our breadth of underwriting expertise is is very broad here. Um, so yeah, those are the only comments I would add. I think it's enough, right? I, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to hear you you talk about those those, those sort of four uh, factors, Don. Eh? Um it, it sort of brings me on to something I was going to kind of ask Siobhan and, and the others anyway, which is that often you, you sort of end up having these conversations about technology, but actually it never works unless you've got the correct talent, good communication in place, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, Siobhan, is, is that sort of your observation as well? And, you know, is, is the right talent out there? Yeah, I mean, I think talent is very important and I think communication. So you said two things there that I think are really material to any conversation that you have with an MGA. So, you know, today I think with talent is 
there's a focus on trying to bring young talent into the market. I think that that is very important to the insurance industry. I think it tends to have a bit of a sleepy reputation. And I think it's, you know, it really needs to acquire young people and make insurance interesting. I think it's very important. To me, when I got my career at Lloyd's of London, it was amazing. I just, you know, thought I had died and gone, gone to heaven. You know, uh, the insurance industry has to, you know, compete with the tech industry and other industries. And they have to make insurance kind of look more sexy. I think we need to attract young talent into this in industry, and that actually will create innovation in itself. You know, bringing people in from outside dis different uh, disciplines always breaks up the model and brings something to it. Um, I, the other factor that you mentioned is communication. You know, levels of communication and transparency add to professionalism you know when you communicate you anticipate when you anticipate you problem solve and they are very important you know i like to think the big thing about the insurance industry is it's really a people business you know it's it's really key understanding your partner's problems and anticipating them and trying to solve them that's really what it's all about at the end of the day yeah um matt what, what would be your perspective on talent because you as you sort of explained earlier you've seen quite a a long period in the, in the way this industry has changed and you know the thing with um rapid changes i guess you do need the right people at the right time doing the right things eg talent is, is the right are the right people around at the moment do you think uh I, yeah i do i do but we you know as an industry we haven't done the best job you know promoting uh, you know, the, the next generation and i think we're, we're starting to do that as we come on with like which Siobhan mentioned um but as far as the you know, specific talent uh, to, to to run, um, you know, an MGA, I absolutely think there's the, the, there's the talent available, uh, and it takes a you know a you know a certain individual, an entrepreneurial spirit to to really want to you know hang out their own shingle and 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 you know be become an MGA, right? And I think that in and of itself um, lends itself to you know needing true partners, whether it's a carrier or a reinsurer. And uh, you know, complete transparency. I think having uh, you know the, the the right hybrid carrier and the reinsurer from day one makes the the uh, the business plan you know that much more doable. And you know, we spend a lot of time. I spend a lot of time. My team spends a lot of time, really qualifying the MGA, working with the MGA on their business plan, and marrying them with the right hybrid carrier um, that has the same. Um, you know, underwriting expertise or, uh, you know, um, focus on claims or technology uh, embracement. So I, I think um, all of that comes down to really the communication. Uh, but I, I do think there's uh, the, the talent there and we're seeing that. I mean, we're, we, we see a, uh, you know, a significant uh, lift out uh, of talent from some of the, the larger uh, national uh, carriers, right? um to to start their own uh mga and and, and partner with folks like asic um uh, that could bring the carrier capacity uh, and i think that's driven by you know there's there's a lot of risk but there's also a lot of reward by by, by doing that so um, yeah that's my thoughts on it jeremy would you agree that talent and communication are differentiating factors in this uh landscape no question no question you know touching on something that siobhan said was um, we have to make insurance as attractive as tech. Um, and, um, you know, I think the way that we really do that is folding in technology. It's that simple. It really isn't, um, you know, some, some real Rubik's cube to, to, to crack and solve. It is the application of technology. It is the ability to, um, allow for well, what, what I call it really the translation layer. The thing that got me so interested in the insured text, you have, you know, insurance policies, a DNO form. Is only you can only innovate where the comma goes so many times. Um, you know the key is the underwriting, the algorithms, how it's deployed, how it's displayed. That conversation between your more traditional insurance uh, experts and the technology that's not only reinvigorating. I think some of those that have been in the industry for a very long time, but it is creating a level of problem solving excitement that you attract both engineers you attract the technology and the coding aspects but the younger you know the younger talent that maybe wouldn't have thought of insurance 
Mm -hmm. Now they're getting to think through, okay, how do I deploy this for my contemporaries? How do I come up with a way to market this the right way? How do I deploy, okay, I see a gap in the, the data analytics. There is a way where I think this class is a better risk than this class. How do we find the proxy in the data? Because it's all there. We're swimming in data in today's, in today's world. I think the key is finding the talent that's excited about it and finding the talent that can then grab the right aspects of that data that bridges those kind of gaps. Okay. Um, so I feel we've sort of uh, covered the challenges, a lot of the solutions and certainly technology. Um, we've got about 15 minutes to run um, and we've got some quite interesting questions coming in, some of which I don't even understand, but I'd encourage the panelists to look at them. Um, perhaps before we get to that, it might be worth um, taking a sort of spin into the future. I'd be really interested in what you all sort of see coming down the pipeline in this landscape at the moment. Um, Matt, perhaps, uh, perhaps starting with you, any thoughts on how you think the market will continue to change uh, in the coming years? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I think we will see uh, we'll see consolidation. Quite frankly, I think there's you know it's a very crowded market, particularly in the uh, the, the fronting hybrid space. I, I think there's going to be uh, you know a, a, a flight to quality on that front, um, and you know the, the the folks that can really differentiate themselves and attract the best MJ partners. Will, will rise to the top, um, you know, and I also think, I mean, we're, I know we keep hitting on technology, but I, it, it, it reminded me of some meetings I had last week in New York where reinsurers were, were asking me about how certain carriers manage and control their, their, their MGA exposures. And is it real time? Is it monthly? Is it, you know, is it 45 days out? And that's really something that I think is going to be a key differentiator for reinsurers and, and, and help uh, get them comfortable with 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 new opportunities and and really embrace you know uh, the, the the space going forward. Um, so you know real time management and you know an, an open dialogue and a true partnership with the carrier um, is it, it, going to be critical. Um, what else do I see in kind of the crystal ball? I think the you know the ENS market will continue to grow uh, pretty dramatically over the next you know few years. Particularly, uh, there's just so much rate that's being pushed out by reinsurers that's really forcing the hand. And you know I think you, you can be like Siobhan said, you can be a lot more nimble um, on a, a non-emitted basis, uh, and it helps our MJ partners. You know, you know being able to to move in and out of you know different geographies, things like that. So I think we'll see continued growth there. Uh, and then, you know, the MGA space, I, I think we're seeing, uh, you know, some pretty frothy uh, valuation still. Hmm. I think that will continue. I think, uh, you know, there's a, it's a really solid uh, business model and it's a, it's, you know, for those that can figure out, uh, you know, the underwriting, the tech, the, the partnerships with carriers and capacity providers, they're going to continue to attract you know, some pretty high valuations. So then that leads to, you know, really more entrepreneurs, you know, coming into the space. Um, so I'm, I'm, we're bullish at Guy Carpenter and, uh, you know, we've invested heavily in the space and, uh, you know, look forward to see what the future brings. Okay. Um, Jeremy, what are your sort of uh, predictions for the future of this landscape? Well, my, my first hope is that, you know, Matt's last point uh, holds true as an, as an <laughs> venture backed uh, MGA itself. So from your lips to God's ears, um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I really do think that the, the concentration um, is the key. Actually, not only do I, I hope that it happens, but I think that's really what needs to happen. There is that, that flight to stellar. I think that's really what it is. We have to have um, the right threshold with which we analyze what is good, what is bad, what is the best in class. And I think that's happening. I think those that are performing in the right way and adapting in the right way are rising to the top naturally. Um, and I think we all have to kind of be conscious of that and that will happen. Um, you know, I, I do believe that underwriting risk the results, the performance of the book, and the way in which an insured ultimately interacts with their insurance policy and all those that support that, that's the key. And so if you are able to string that along, that's where the future will be. So everyone likes to use the term full stack. Um, it's about as buzzwordy as it is in our industry. 
But when you think about the full stack of the value chain, if you can intertwine all of that and make sure that you are embracing all of the technology going all the way back kind of full circle to when we started, that's how those early stage companies that are going to promote that innovation are going to kind of rise to that level. The other key is the partnerships, those that embrace it, the ASICs, the guy carps. I mean, you have, you know, to give credit where, where maybe they get overlooked is the brokers. I mean, you know, bring it all the way back, but they're the ones that kind of, you know, curate and collate all of these programs with the right reinsurance, with the right fronts, with the right MGAs. Um, so I, I do think that it's not just the MGAs that will find that kind of flight to the stellar, it's kind of the entire stack. Okay, great. Um, Dominic, perhaps we'll come to you next and, and then um, Siobhan sort of lastly. And can I, we have loads of questions now, can all the panelists take a look and we'll um, come to them in the end. But uh, Dominic, as Chief Underwriting Officer, we've talked about how you've seen the market evolve. What are your sort of predictions now for how it will continue to do so? Yeah, you know, many of the comments that are made, I agree with. I think capacity will continue to be tight. And I think what reinsurers are looking for is they're looking for companies that are going to take risk more traditional approach. The more skin in the game you have, I think the likelihood that the reinsurers will support that. And I saw, I think those those fronting hybrid carriers who do, want to take little or no risk, I think they're going to have they're going to have issues. And I think from an MGA standpoint, I mean, we look at about 70, 80 programs a year, and we we might launch a handful possibly. And I think that's very selective because we need to manage the portfolio by line of business. Right. I think that's that's critical. And the fact that, you know, from an MGA standpoint, again, I talked about the breadth of experience that we have. We don't have nine divisions within this company. We've got we've got an extensive uh, level of experience between property, casualty, cyber, transportation and all in one here in Dallas in the same room that can collaborate. And MGAs want collaboration. A lot of you, I think what MGAs have seen, we've talked about that previously, they've seen those relationships dwindle, uh, a lack of respect for what they bring to the table. Here, we respect that, we understand it. It's critical, the communication, understanding what they bring to the table, understanding everybody's role, including Matt's role from a broker standpoint. So having the relationship with the MGA, with the broker, with reinsurers, where we're sharing information through the broker, that means sharing underwriting audits that we do, because that's what underwriters do. Being aligned with profit, I mean, that's really gonna be the key, and I think that's gonna be the difference maker as we go forward. Okay, Siobhan, predictions, please. I mean, uh, from my perspective, I think that the ENS space will continue to grow because I think U.S., you know, in a broad perspective, U.S. risk is attractive, it's high quality, it's stable, you know, the, it comes from a strong base. Um, I think if I can add anything, it's about profitability at the end of the day. You know, in previous markets, you've had new capital that's been able to come into the market and take advantage of the, you know, you know of the market conditions. It's not clear that that's actually happening in this market. You know, new capital isn't stepping in to relieve the capacity crunch. And, you know, profitability is the key to that. The market has to be attractive to capital to participate in the market. And how do you do that? You know, you have to have a profitable model. So again, it goes back to old fashioned underwriting criteria, you know, underwriting expertise, really, in my opinion. You know, the market needs capital, it needs that boost, and, and um, profitability is, is the key that opens that door. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Siobhan. Um, <clears throat> sorry, we've got about five, ten minutes left to run. Um, as I said, we've got some quite interesting questions, so we'll perhaps get through some of these, and then we can sort of touch on any sort of final uh, conclusions. Um, just sort of pick in from these, slightly myself for a moment. Um, somebody's asked what the speakers think about results-oriented methods, like sliding scale uh, commissions, are they good for the market, market or bad for the market? Um, Jeremy, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think it goes to the theme and we've touched on it many times is the alignment of interest. And so, um, you know, everyone should stand behind their product and whether that product is distribution, whether that product is claims, whether that product is licensure uh, and expertise or or it's you know, risk capacity. And so a sliding scale does exactly that. Everyone shares in the downside, everyone shares in the upside, and we're all in it together. And I think that 
that kind of goes against what maybe the legacy ethos was, where it's, you know, I need to solidify my point. I know what I'm going to book in revenue. I know what I'm going to book in production. And I think everyone embracing that at every level, um, that's what makes for the innovative thought process. And that's what makes for a, an ever expanding book and profitability in my opinion. Okay, Matt, slide and scale commissions. Are you uh, any thoughts on those? Yeah. No, I, yeah, I would agree 100%. I, I, and I think it's also a way for MGAs to participate, uh, you know, in the underwriting without forming, you know, a captive or, you know, a segregated cell. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes back to the alignment of interest. That, you know, absolutely. I think, um, you know, MGAs need to be more underwriting focused than production focused. You know, there's a balance there, but especially going in this hard market, uh, you know, underwriting um, uh, profitability is going to be key. So, uh, you know, absolutely on the, the sliding scale commission. Okay. Uh, Siobhan or Dominic, anything to add? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you, you only have so many tools in your basket. I think a sliding scale is a very um, effective way of creating equity within the, you know, experience. Um, so again, it goes back to profitability, you know, you produce the right results, you get properly rewarded and the sl sliding scale kind of does that very, very uh, effectively. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would add is it's just a commitment of profit, right? And they, they believe in their product and when they have skin in the game, that's what we want to see from a carrier yeah. perspective. Okay. Uh, potentially quick one, maybe I, on, um, API, um, API or another technology is potentially the answer, but somebody's asked about the, I guess, the problematic uh, nature of the legacy of different companies. Um, Jeremy, anything on that you'd like to say? It's a challenge. Um, you know, there's no way to, 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 to color that in any other way because legacy systems weren't built for this. The same way that regulations, um, you know, that were put into place you know, hundreds of years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, aren't contemplative of the technology, the legacy systems weren't as well. And so what I think the challenge actually flips, people think that it's the incumbents that 100% have to change their systems, which is true. And I don't want to, you know, take anyone, you know, down a different path. But I do think the MGAs, as they develop their, uh, their technology and their systems, they have to be contemplative of the legacy systems, not try and just disrupt make it better, make them interconnective. Um, because if you don't, then we're just going to hit a point where none of the systems can work together. And that doesn't behoove uh, you know, our industry and the market as a whole. Okay, anybody else like to add to that? I mean, I, I think you know, part of it is that MGAs have almost been created out of the you know, innovative concept, stepping away from the conventional carrier, moving into classes where they've been able to, you know, move in the mga is such an efficient way of writing business and particularly when you have a high level of expertise you know you have niche focused uh you know mga writing that business and you know that is part of the issue with these massive big carriers you know mgas have been able to move into this space and and dominate certain aspects and control them um you know because they have the innovation they can be nimble they make the results and they can be profitable okay Okay. Um, just another question. Uh, somebody's asked, it's quite a nuanced question about digital distribution and I guess what that kind of might mean for MGAs long term. Um, I think they're sort of suggesting, will it mean um, increasing sort of a concentration of policy options? I guess by that they mean really niche products or actually a broadening where things are packaged together. Um, uh, would anybody like to, to like to talk about digital distribution? Sure. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very shy, um, but you know, I think the answer there is um, it's 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 neither you know specialty concentration or going broad base. I think it's it's kind of a, a you know to use our term a hybrid of that. And what I think the key for the digital distribution is to increase your point of penetration over a broad base kind of set of, of lines of business. And what I mean by that is. If you are using a set of underwriting algorithms or ethos in itself for commercial insurance, let's say you're looking at the small to medium businesses, you're looking at the micro on the commercial side, you can put together a suite of products that aren't necessarily niche, a cyber, a DNO, um, a paid parental leave, a business owner's policy that all target the same, but are different classes. And so what you wanna do is you wanna take 
a broad based approach to your products mm -hmm. with a concentrated distribution ethos and the technology and, di and digital distribution can aid in that because they can penetrate the point of sale for that exact same insured, decreasing your cost of acquisition and increasing your opportunity to cross sell amongst those products. That's a good point. Yeah, you know, what Jeremy just described is something that from a carrier perspective, this is where we sit down at a table and, and Jeremy says, okay, hey, listen, we've got this, we've got this idea. And he laid and the team lays it out and we and we we collaborate back and forth because if you're going to be true to a long-term partnership, you need to think about these alternative ways to profitably grow the portfolio, right? Yeah. So, great example, Jeremy. Okay. Anyone else? No. I think okay. we nailed it. Um, well, we're supposed to. We're supposed to. Um, this was scheduled for an hour. We have run through that now. Um, thank you for all the audience interaction and the questions. Uh, if we didn't get to yours, apologies. I'm just going to ask the panelists just. One last thing, um, any final thoughts or points that you feel we've missed that you'd like to make now in sort of the next minute, if that's all right. Um, uh, Matt, perhaps we can start with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, as, you know, final points. I, I, I think, uh, you know, there's some there's some themes here, uh, flight to quality and, you know, the, the ability to identify the right partner, right? Whether it's the carrier, the reinsurer, reinsurance broker, you know, whatever it might be. I think those are the the, the keys uh, for, you know, the folks that are listening that may be MGAs or starting MGAs, depending on where they're on the life cycle. Uh, so I would, you know, keep that in mind and, and encourage them to, you know, to in, embrace technology and, and, you know, the flight to quality is good. It has to be there. Okay. Jeremy? Yeah. Uh, you know, an easy echo on that. It's, you know, it's also keep an open mind. And that's not just the MGA that's on, on the back end of the book, too. It's, you know, everyone, you know, needs to keep that those eyes open because that's one, how we'll foster innovation, but two, how we will keep new entrants in the market, attract that talent. Um, the flight to quality will naturally happen if we do that. If you are embracing that technology um, and going back, it's making sure you're embracing technology, not just to say you have technology. It's making sure it permeates every aspect of what your individual part of the of the cycle is or the entirety of that stack. OK, great. Um, perhaps Dominic next and we'll give uh, Siobhan the final word. Yeah. You know, again, from my perspective, you know, there are, there are many carriers, I'm sure that Jeremy hears on from, from his perspective that, you know, they, they talk the good game. Right. But it's following through and clearly communicating and being open to ideas and looking at long-term plays, right? And I think that's gonna be, that's where we're gonna be successful. That's where Boost has been successful. The relationship here between the reinsurance broker with with Matt and, and then on the MGA side with Boost is critical, right? And respecting everybody's position there, but collaborating, continue to collaborate and driven by profit because we're an underwriting company first, right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'd say communication, underwriting discipline, and profitability. Okay, good final word. <laughs> okay, well, um, thanks so much to the panelists and everybody watching this. Um, I thought it was a really interesting discussion, so hopefully, uh, hopefully we got lots of that, we took lots away from that. We had some good questions as well, which hopefully we answered. Um, anybody who missed part of this, you will be sent the full recording, so you can uh, listen at your leisure or listen again at your leisure. Um, and thank you to all the panelists, of course, ASIC for working with us to put this together and um, sponsoring it. So uh, thank you all. Thanks, Thanks so much. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great.